Glad to see everybody here today. We had a little bit smaller crew last week with the snow, so it's good to see everybody made it back safe and got dug out and whatever that looks like for you. Um, we're going to finish up, uh, kind of finish up our chapter by chapter look at the book of Philippians. We haven't been going verse by verse, but just chapter by chapter. And uh, the, the kind of the... the thrust of this series is that idea of joy and I talked about how this was a decoration that I pulled out of a Christmas tote of my wife's Christmas decorations. I call them my wife's decorations because I know what my house looked like before I was married to my wife and, and there were not a lot of decorations. Um, yeah. Anyways, so the idea was do we pull this out at a certain time of the year and then just say, oh, now I have joy because I took this thing out of my tote, right? Uh, Paul, in the letter of Philippians, is telling us that we can have joy in all seasons, in whatever life brings us, that joy that comes from the fruit of the Spirit is bigger than our surroundings, bigger than our circumstances, bigger than what we see in life. So in chapter 4, we're going to look at some scriptures that are very familiar, very familiar scriptures. Some of them are quoted in times when we offer encouragement to people. Some of them are quoted, even thought of, uh, at least in part to ourselves when we're struggling in certain ways or areas. And there's one, one big one that I think gets maybe misapplied quite frequently. And we're going to look at that one today as well. So this is going to be a really good uh, practical, I called it joy in all things. Because as we wrap up this, this idea, the idea that we have joy in all things. And the title of the series, week by week, I've been talking about those old Got Milk commercials. You remember those? And I've been trying to find a commercial that kind of ties back in to the theme of the message for the week. So here's the Got Milk commercial that inspired this. Well, it didn't inspire this message. I'll just <laughs> want to make sure I didn't say that that way. Okay. Here's the, the commercial that I reference. So there's these two kids sitting at the breakfast table, and mom is over here uh, getting things set up, and the kids are kind of complaining. She's saying, drink your milk, and they say, I don't want to drink my milk. That milk's for babies. I don't want my, you know. And she says, no, milk is good. It helps you get strong bones and things like that. And the kids are looking out the window at Mr. Miller doing some yard work, and they say, well, Mr. Miller told us he never drinks milk. And look at him. And they look out the window at Mr. Miller, and he's out in his yard. Hey, kids! And he's got his wheelbarrow full of all kinds of debris and dirt and whatever. He's cleaning up. His yard looks great. And he bends down and grabs the handles of the wheelbarrow, and he stands up like this, and both of his arms rip right off of his <laughs> shoulders, right? You knew that one? You remember that one? And Mr. Miller says, oh, that's not good, right? And the kids, Duh, and they start just, they're all about drinking their milk when they see that happen, right? But that's kind of the idea for this message. The idea being that we're going to look at some things that just all of us encounter. And we're going to look at like, we can look at some folks that don't have the joy of the Lord, that don't have that fruit of the Spirit. And from the outward appearance, things might look like they're going well. They might look like Mr. Miller's yard looked before his arms fell off, right? That's kind of the idea. But then as we see how life progresses for these people that don't have joy, we start to see the difference, don't we? And we've talked about that even to the end when we're at the funeral of a believer versus a non-believer, just the difference in tone. So that's the idea. That's what I want you to be thinking about. Again, another very introspective message today as you think about how does this apply to you. So I'm going to pray. And then we're going to dig in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you that you give us the ability through your Holy Spirit to have joy in all things. And God, so as we go into your word now, would you just accomplish your purpose for it? Holy Spirit, be at work in this place. Bring encouragement, bring conviction. Do all the things you do. Have freedom in this space. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're taking notes on the app or on the bulletin, the first thing that we're going to look at today is joy in peace. Joy in peace. Uh, chapter 4, Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. 
The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There's a familiar verse, right? Peace that passes understanding. We talk about that a lot, don't we? So the key that I want to point out is the idea of bringing what we may tend to worry about or that we might be anxious about, bringing that to the Lord. Bringing that to the Lord. And this is when we're able to turn those things that we may be anxious about, that we may be worried about, we're able to turn them into joy. We're able to trade them for joy. So we, I, I'll just personalize this, I may want to hold on to some of these things, to have control. Does anybody here like to have control of things in their life? So if you're finding that you're wanting to hold on to these things, and that you're worrying about these things, and you're anxious about these things, that's probably the best indicator that you haven't actually given them to the Lord. Do you see how that transfer happens? Do you see how that works? And this sounds like a lot like what Paul told the Thessalonian church when he told them to pray without ceasing. In all things. In all things. So we see the result of that when we, when we have these burdens, these worries, and we bring them to the Lord, right? With a thankful heart that's willing to actually release them to the Lord. This peace comes upon us that passes our understanding. And it does two things. Letter A on your notes is it guards our heart. Guards our heart. So this is, there's a few things here. If our heart is guarded, that means that our heart is guarded against bitterness. Okay? That we can have this, this idea without having our hearts guarded that, that we might be bitter against someone. If we have an issue with someone, that we might grow bitter towards them. Peace that gives us joy in our heart, guards against that. Guards against that bitterness that tends to set in. Peace that comes from the Lord helps us maintain a softness of heart. When our heart is guarded, it's able to have a softness to what the Lord is up to, what the Lord is doing. It can help us to be looking towards a time when we can reconcile that issue, maybe, that we've been worrying about or that thing that we've been worried about. And it's a softness in our hearts that can help us work towards what needs to happen in order for that to be reconciled. And it guards our hearts against the hardening, maybe towards the whole situation. Peace that surpasses understanding guards our hearts. And it also guards our mind. So I have a little graphic I'm going to put up here. This is like kind of the the spiral of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, have you ever heard of these things? Have you ever heard of these things? You've maybe you've done this, I've done this, but you've you've played the whole scene out in your head. Right? You have something that's coming up and you just know exactly what's going to happen. You know what what maybe that other person is going to say, you know how you're going to respond to it, you know what's going to happen next, you know you've played the whole scene out in your head. And we do this because we've done this and we've been right. Does that make sense? Like we've already gone into a situation. We've said, I'm going to say this. And then this person is going to say that. And then I'm going to respond by saying or doing this, which in turn will cause them to say or respond by doing this. We've seen that happen. We've all experienced that, right? And it affects our beliefs about ourselves, towards others, about us, towards us. Okay, all those things. When that peace that passes understanding comes in, in this situation, it breaks that cycle. It breaks that cycle. It guards our mind against doing this. Does that make sense? So we get that peace, we guard our mind, and it helps us to not jump on this wheel and keep going around and around on this cycle. It's this peace of God that says, okay, I'm okay with the unknown because you know, God. I'm okay with the unknown because you know. And I'm offering you this situation in prayer with thanksgiving, and I'm trusting my heart 
and my mind, and I'm going to rest in the joy and the peace that comes when I'm able to do that. Peace that I don't understand. Now, that seems pretty easy to understand, right? We all just want peace that passes our understanding and guards our hearts and guards our mind. But our own experiences will tell some of us that we don't really want peace. Or maybe we know people that it seems like just thrive when there's chaos and discord, right? We've all been that person. Let's start at home first. We've all been that person or we've known that person, right? They just need to have trouble. They need to have discord. They need to have conflict. And that can be a result of a lot of things. And I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of that stuff now. But what Paul is saying is there's a peace that's available to all people, peace that can break that cycle. Peace that guards your heart, guards your mind, passes understanding and breaks that cycle when we make our requests known to God. So how is that going with you? How is that going with you? How is your time with the Lord? Are you finding joy in the peace that comes from a lifestyle of offering all things to Him? Releasing burdens? When you're releasing those burdens to the Lord? So, application-wise, it's a new year, right? We all do the, everybody made your list of New Year's resolutions and things like that, and you wait till Monday to start because New Year's fell on a weekend, so it doesn't really count. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, Monday is fine, yeah. Yeah, but so in the new year, it's a, it's a good time for new beginnings, right? It's, it's a natural time for us to do those things. But is there a pattern or a routine that you can enter into this new year more and more that will help develop this attitude that opens you up to being able to have a heart and a mind that's guarded by the peace of God and that you can experience that joy and peace? Number two, joy and focus. Another awesome, familiar section of Scripture here, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Joy and focus. Okay, I have another picture I'm going to put up here. How do you see that glass? Is that glass half full or is that glass half empty? Now, don't come at me with the it's full because it's half full of water, half full of air. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? But how do you see that glass? What are you focusing on? What are you focusing on? Now, my wife will tell you that I'm an optimist to a fault. And she will also tell you that very often my optimism is not helpful. (laughs) So how do you think her and I see this glass? (laughs) But this is about our focus. That's what this is about. It's about our focus. So we all know people that tend to see things one way or the other. We all know people that will see it half full. We all know people that will see it half empty, right? As you encounter situations in life, either you're going to approach them just looking at them generally from a negative perspective, looking for the bad, seeing the bad, Or you're going to look at things that come towards you in life from the positive side, looking at the good, seeing the good, things like that, right? Now, I want to clarify this. Paul is not saying everything is true, honorable, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, or worthy of praise. It's not what he said. Not at all. He knows better. Paul knows better. And so do all of us. Has anybody ever experienced anything that is not True, honorable, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Have you ever, all of you, ever experienced anything that fits those categories to the negative? Yeah, we all have. We know that they're out there. Paul's been nearly beat to death. He's in prison when he's writing this. He's aware that there are things 
that you will encounter that are not on that list. And I'm guessing you could give us a long list of things that don't fit into those categories. But he's saying choose to focus on those things in that list. Choose to focus on those things. When you, simple, when you look at a rose bush, do you see the thorns or do you see the flowers? We know there's thorns there, right? We know they're there, but what are you focusing on? Paul is saying that we can have joy in situations when we focus on those things that he has listed. And I think, again, for some folks, it's going to be a, a whole paradigm shift. To change your focus, it'll be a whole paradigm shift about how you're looking at everything by changing your focus. Now, to clarify, because this could sound kind of self-helpy at this point, okay? This is not a self-help talk, okay? This is not a self-help talk, okay? I'm not saying, what I don't want you to hear me say when you leave today is that I'm saying think good things and good things will happen. It's not what I'm saying, okay? I'm not saying that you have the power in your own thoughts to make bad things good. That's not what I'm saying. And that's not what Paul is saying, okay? In fact, here's what I want you to hear me say. This is not about you having a good day. Okay? It's really not about you having a good day. I hope you all have a wonderful day. But that's not what this is about. Some of you are probably going to have really bad days, today or tomorrow or the next day. And I probably will too. Okay? But what I want you to know is how can I have joy when I'm not having a good day? Does that make sense? This is not self-help. Paul is saying that when we choose what we will focus on, the God of peace will be with us. Now this is our cause for joy and comfort, that the God of peace will be with us. Because if we focus on things contrary to the list, we experience the opposite of the God of peace being with us. Verse 9, basically what Paul is saying is live a discipled life. Live a discipled life. Things you've been taught through teaching, life lessons you've learned, walking with people through situations and circumstances that the Lord has brought into their life. The principles that Scripture gives us to live a godly life, choose those to be your focus. Choose those to be your actions. Choose those things to be what you do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, practical for us today. A lot of us need to change our focus. Plain and simple. A lot of us need to change our focus. So think about <clears throat> your focus. For some of us, we need to turn off the news. Amen. Yeah, and social media. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. That's right. I'm getting there. That's right. There you go. There you go. Two weeks. Shut it off. Shut off the news for two weeks. See what happens to your focus. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Right now. Amen. She's on it. She. Yes. Amen, Serena. No Facebook. Yeah. Turn it off. There you go. Turn it off. Preach. <laughs> Preach. Turn it off. That's right. Were you looking at my notes? No, that is my notes. Because the next thing I got here is, that, that's what I got the other, the next thing is for others, get off social media. <laughs> Literally. Like, shut it off. Shut it off. Take a break. Take a break. It's okay. It's okay. They'll all be okay without you. I promise. Your, your like or your, your retweet or whatever, your share, they'll get by without you. Give them a couple weeks without you. See how it goes. Take a break. Stop looking at everybody else's highlight reels and comparing them to your own life. For others, here's what it's going to be. And especially if you use those things to help change your focus, it's going to be a renewed time with the Lord. 
focusing on a renewed time with the Lord as your focus, as your focus. Again, it's a new year, right? We can make all the new commitments and things like that. So maybe this is a time when you can renew some of those commitments to spiritual disciplines, right? It's okay. Everybody gets a free pass at the beginning of the year to say, I'm going to do this, right? It's a good time to change your focus. So a renewed focus on spiritual disciplines. I know the ladies have a small group of them have a hermitage coming up where they're going to practice some time of solitude, things like that. What is God calling you to? It's a new year. Make a commitment afresh to be in the word, to be in prayer, to change your focus. Change your focus. Number three, joy and contentment. Joy and contentment. <clears throat> Verses 11 through 13. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In every circumstance, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There it is. That's the verse right there, isn't it? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Through Christ who strengthens me. All things. I can dunk a basketball on a 10-foot rim through Christ who strengthens me. Come on! Get fired up, right? I can have all kinds of money and never have to go to work through Christ who strengthens me. Right? No? That's not what that means? Oh, man, I thought that's what that meant. That's what the t-shirt said, right? That verse gets thrown around a lot, doesn't it? It gets thrown around all the time. And it's a wonderful verse when we understand the context of it and the concept that Paul is trying to drive home. Look, <clears throat> I'm not dunking a hoop, or not dunking a basketball on a 10-foot hoop. It just ain't going to happen, okay? Unless I get a boost or a trampoline or something like that. But I will dunk on an eight, maybe eight and a half foot hoop. Okay, I'll do it. That's not what Paul's talking about. We might use that verse to encourage someone, and that's great if it's applied appropriately. But Paul's focus is not on doing all things. That's not the focus. The focus is on the protection and the provision of God in all things. That's the focus. He is saying, I've been in times and situations where I've been in great danger. Great danger. Where I didn't have food, where I was in great distress. And I've had times where I was well fed. Where I was experiencing great blessing. Even to overflowing. And in all those times, I was able to have joy in them because of the provision and the protection of God. And it was that provision and that protection that allows me to have joy and contentment no matter what the situation. The Amplified Version has a great, is a great translation for this verse. I'm going to read that, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Amplified Version. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. So if God doesn't call me to dunk a basketball on a 10-foot hoop, I still would, I mean, I think it'd be cool but I'm not going to claim this verse and say, I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about recognizing in your life the protection and the provision of God in whatever situation you find yourself in. If it's a season where 
he is doing great, where Paul is doing great and his ministry is being blessed, he's able to be content. If it's a season where he's in prison, he's able to be content. Would content be a word that you would use to describe yourself? Content. Personally, I didn't even realize how discontent I was before I came to Christ. I did not realize how discontent of a person I was. I was just a get it done guy, right? Whatever needs to happen, I'm going to make it happen one way or another. Whatever I think I need, I'm going to get by whatever means necessary to get that thing, right? If it means going deeper into debt to get that thing, that sparkly deal that I think I need, or if it means uh, burning a bridge or, or stressing a relationship or whatever it would be, if that's what I needed, then that's what I was going to do to chase whatever I thought was going to make me content. Now, I am not saying that I have arrived on the shores of contentment and I'm patiently awaiting all of you to get there. That's not what I'm saying either, okay? But I am closer than I once was. I can clearly see that in my heart and in my life now. But we live in a world that breeds discontentment. We live in a world that breeds discontentment. The things you are buying are obsolete before you get home. And by the time you get home, that thing you just bought that's now obsolete is telling you you need the next thing that's not obsolete yet. We're on a cycle of discontentment. The world around us is breeding discontentment. And Paul is saying that there's a contentment available in Christ that's not available anywhere else. That it's not available anywhere else. So I read a cool little little story illustration thing when I was talking or studying this and it was about this guy who's just he's been in the in the throes of work and life and parenting and marriage and all these things and he's just to this point where he's broken down and he's feeling disconnected spiritually disconnected emotionally just he's done and so he goes to this monastery for like a retreat thing right and he wants to just shut everything off and get connected spiritually, emotionally. He wants to meet the Lord. And so he goes to this monastery and, and the monks kind of receive him in and they're going to show him to his quarters and things like that. And they bring him to his room and it's, it's I mean, it's picture a monastery, right? Like there's not much there, right? He doesn't have to ask for the Wi-Fi code, right? But so they bring him in and then they show him kind of his quarters and then as, as they're starting to, you know, kind of leave him there, the, the monk turns around and he says, Hey, um, if you need anything, get a hold of us, let us know, and we'll teach you how to live without it. <laughs> and that sums up what Paul is saying here. This is a choice, contentment. Peace and contentment is a choice. It's a behavior that we learn, and then we choose that behavior. We're not born content, but we can learn contentment by seeing the faithfulness of God. We can learn to be content in any situation when we see protection and provision. Whether we're in our lowest of lows or our highest mountaintop experience, we learn that God is going to provide what we need. And I've said this before, many of us have our need list and our want list very confused. Jesus told us this. He's explaining in John 15 the idea of the vine and the branches. And we're told that we need to be abiding in him. That he is the vine, we are the branches. And he gives more insight into this principle that Paul is trying to show us. In John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And Jesus goes on to explain how when we're abiding in him, we're going to have seasons of life. Seasons where we're bearing much fruit. Those would be our highs. And then we're going to have seasons of pruning. Painful, low, hurt, loss. We're going to have those seasons. But through all the seasons, we can have joy. And he tells us this in verse 11 of that same chapter. These things I have spoken to you, that you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. It's available through that abiding relationship. So contentment. What does contentment look like for you? Are you someone like I've confessed, has struggled with contentment over the years? Have you lacked for joy because you've lacked contentment? Does the idea of seeing God's provision and protection and faithfulness help you to develop that contentment in your life that you can have joy in? Think back to your lowest experiences. Think back to your lowest experiences. If you look at those things and you look for that, protection and that provision, can you see it? Think about your highest mountaintop experiences. Sometimes when we have those high mountaintop experiences, it's pretty easy for us to think that we are the ones that got us there. But can you see how God protected and provided for you in those mountaintop experiences? And how does this help you to have contentment in the conditions you have right now. Right now. Because a lot of us aren't in our lowest of low right now, but a lot of us aren't in our highest of high right now either. A lot of us are just kind of going through it right now, right? So if we know that we can be content in the high, and we know that we can be content in the low, can we be content in the day-to-day? -day? Yes. Because God is protecting and providing, and he's faithful today as well. Number four, joy and generosity. Joy and generosity. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Another one that gets thrown around quite a bit, right? right? You might see that one on TV sometimes if you know what I'm saying. Paul has just thanked the Philippian church for their generosity. They partnered with him as he's advanced the gospel. They helped him work through uh, his travels, to, to work throughout his travels. They sent him gifts in prison, and Paul is very thankful for that. The Philippian church has been a very generous church. And the idea that we're stewards of what God has provided is, is just a simple truth that you have to come to know and embrace, that we're stewards. That's all we are. For some of you, that's like, yeah, tell me something I don't know. Like Some of you get it. Some of you understand that we're only stewards. You live an open-handed lifestyle, willing to let the Lord move freely in and out of your hands, your bank book, your calendar, whatever it is, you let the Lord lead that, and it's easy for you to do that. So as I'm talking about this, if that's you, you already understand that joy in generosity that Paul is talking about. You already understand it. But for others, joy and generosity may be a very foreign concept. Maybe you've heard people talk about it. The idea of joyfully giving is a strange concept to some folks. In another letter Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he, he told them to be cheerful givers. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Idea being God owns all of it. He owns our money. He owns our talents. He owns our time. We operate completely in His grace, with His provision. Our next breath is only by the grace of God. 
And he uses his people to bless other people through giving. Through giving. People who are cheerful givers, who have joy and generosity, seem to, maybe you've experienced this or seen this, seem to be the people that God blesses in order that they can bless others. Quite frequently. God entrusts resources to those folks that are faithfully looking for ways to give with joy. And we can give in a lot of ways financially. We can give time, volunteering at a ministry or an organization, which many of you do. We can give to the work of spreading the gospel through missions. And what Paul is saying in verse 19 is that when we give, we don't need to worry if we are going to leave ourselves short. That's really what he's saying. We don't have to worry that we're going to leave ourselves short. He's reiterating that same principle of contentment, but this time turning it to joy in giving. We give to grow the kingdom. God supplies our needs. We can have joy in that. Joy in that. Now this church is a very generous church. Very generous church. It's been a real blessing over the last two years just to see the faithfulness and the joy in which you, you all give. And, you know, I, I want to share just a simple story, short story, about a way that this church was able to, to give, okay, as a church. So I get phone calls quite frequently throughout the week for people asking for help with different things. And we, as a church, we give to some, some organizations in town and across the world, really, that, that have different missions that they're on. And some of them are local to help with basic things, right? To help with your, your water bill, things like that. So uh, a few weeks ago, I had a woman call me, and she was very worked up when she called. And she explained that her husband uh, couldn't see, basically, couldn't see. Couldn't read street signs when they were driving, couldn't see very well at all, needed glasses, things like that. And there was no one in town that was able to help her. It was near the end of the year, so some of the outfits that normally help maybe were out of funds, things like that. And so I said, what exactly are you, you asking me for? And she said, there's a place in Albany for $70. He can get an eye exam and two pairs of glasses. And I said, okay, go get the exam. And if they can bill us, we'll cover it. She broke down on the phone in tears because she was so thankful that such a simple thing, $70, that she didn't have, that her husband was going to be able to go get an eye exam and some glasses. And this church was able to cover that because you all give. There's other stories I could tell you, but that's such a simple one. Such a simple one. And you, as part of this church, can have joy in the generosity of such a simple thing to you and I, but to that woman and her husband, that was monumental. So have joy in that. Have joy in your generosity. Now, we could get into all kinds of discussions around that about choices and this and that and the other thing, but for right now, I just want you to understand we can have joy in generously providing that for that woman and her husband. Does that make sense? Joy and generosity. So do you have joy in your giving? Do you have joy? Do you give with joy? Just like all these other examples, it's about a choice. It's about a choice. So what is one choice you can make today? One choice you can make today to have joy in generosity. To joyfully be generous. Is there some time you could give to a ministry or an organization? Do you have financial resources that God is calling you to give? What about your gifts? What about your gifts that God has given you? Are you serving and generously giving of yourself? That's the question. That's the question. Joy is about choices we make to follow God's leading in our life. Joy is the fruit of the obedience to what God is calling us to. It's the 
fruit of the Spirit. So maybe when I say the fruit of the Spirit, you're saying, well, that's where I need to start. That's where I need to start. Maybe you've been, like I described, looking for joy in everything the world has to offer, the things that are obsolete before you get them home. And what I want to tell you today is joy, real joy, not counterfeit joy that's available through the world, but there is a joy that is available to you through Jesus. Joy that's available when we turn in repentance from our sin, we recognize it, we call it sin, we turn away from it, we turn towards the finished work of Christ on the cross, and we accept that free gift of salvation that only comes through him, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then we make him Lord of our lives and we stop chasing all the counterfeit joy that's out there. That's what we're going to be celebrating as we go to the Lord's table. We're going to celebrate that gift, that gift that is available through the death and resurrection of Christ. And I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 to show you that, how we celebrate this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We celebrate that here. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, you don't have to be a member of this church, but you need to be a member of the body of Christ. You need to be a member of his church. You need to call him Lord and Savior. And again, if you're not, you're not going to be happy with these portions. Okay? What we're going to do, we're going to uncover the elements, and then we're going to play some music. And while that music is playing, I want you to spend some time in reflection. Think about where is your focus. Think about contentment. Think about that peace that guards your heart and your mind. Think about joy and generosity. Just reflect on this message. Reflect on what God is doing in your heart right now. Surrender things that need to be surrendered to Him. Take some time. And then when you're ready, you can come up and take the elements, and then I'm going to lead us in taking those elements. So you can come up when you're ready, take them back to your seats and wait, and we'll take them together. Let me pray, and then we'll, we'll uh, open up the elements. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you offer joy, real joy, through that gift of Jesus on the cross, that gift of salvation, eternal life, reconciliation with the Holy God, that, that, that Jesus is your only provision for that reconciliation. And so, Lord, as we approach this communion table, as we take these elements in remembrance of that act, the act that brings salvation, Lord, that you would stir it in our hearts, Holy Spirit, that you would work it in our hearts, that we could have joy in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.